This looks like the Los Angeles of the Midwest, but the Twin Cities is more than just freeways. Check this out. They're building a brand new high-speed transit line right here. Zipping people from the far eastern suburbs into downtown St. Paul every morning. I think this thing's going to be half a billion dollars by the time it's done. They're building 10 miles of new transit way across more than a dozen new bridges to serve 16 transit stations with four park and ride lots. But there's just one thing. All of this new construction, it's not for a new train. It's for a new bus. A bus? Metro Transit in our region has had ideas that have gone back decades, like since the 70s and 80s. Why not rebuild rail transit all over town? Well, politicians never could make it happen. If you didn't want to drive a car or didn't have one, you're stuck riding all the little individual bus routes that each suburb seemed to have that kind of work together. But thankfully, 20 years ago, that started to change. A former professional wrestler put the state capitol in a headlock. Here at my urging, the legislature passed and we broke ground for our first light rail transit. And by 2004, you could ride Minneapolis's first modern light rail train, the Blue Line. Excellent transportation, the cost of fortune. This is the green line here. It was the second rail line to open in 2010, and it's a really important one because it connects Minneapolis and St. Paul together, the Twin Cities. It also cost a lot of money, almost twice as much as that first blue line. So it's not to say that Minneapolis doesn't like light rail, it's just it costs more money than they'll ever have to be able to build all the lines to all the places this city justifies having a line. They had to look at something else. What if they built a bus line but took away all the bad parts of riding a bus? Traffic, delays, sketchy bus stops, long waits. Light rail trains tend to fix these problems. But what if to save money instead of laying down some railroad tracks, we put down some concrete instead? This is called bus rapid transit. And I made a video a couple of years ago about how these BRT systems work. I'll put a link in the description so you can check that out next. But today I'm learning one new reason why they're so much cheaper. We are much more familiar with in terms of uh, laborers to build and maintain uh, roadway infrastructure over light rail. I mean, imagine you put this thing out to bid. You say, we're building a new train. Who wants to bid on it? Well, how many companies in the Twin Cities know how to build a train? But you say, hey, we're effectively building a new road. Oh, yeah, there's lots of companies that know how to build roads here. The project development timeline is much faster. It's cheaper to build, so we get to bring those benefits to our riders much faster than a typical light rail project, I would say. Getting a new line built is a challenge in and of itself, but a new one, he tells me, is just hiring enough bus operators and mechanics to be able to keep the system up and running. And it's a lot easier to recruit a bus mechanic than a train mechanic. These new bus rapid transit lines come in three different flavors of price. The fanciest that's just like a train line, we'll get to that in a minute, but some run buses on existing freeways, and a new line that just opened a couple of years ago runs on existing city streets. And frankly, I'm a little skeptical that that could work. And to show you I'm taking this seriously, I'm actually getting out of my car and riding the bus. And Metro Transit tell me this basic level called arterial BRT doesn't have to be fancy. Still, the station's pretty nice. Got a ticket machine here. Well, I think what worked for us is starting with a corridor that you know the ridership is going to be there. Population and employment density, and then get that one right and show the rest of your region, oh, this is what you're talking about. For example, on a BRT line, you won't find any of these classic bus stops. A sign on the side of the road and you're out in the elements with everything else. At least this bus stop has a bus bench. Morning, ma'am. You waiting for the 74 bus too, huh? Yep, me too. Even their simplest BRT line doesn't leave me out in the cold. That comfortable customer experience. So there's light and heat. In the winter, Minnesota can get cold. And I'm not talking like cold, I'm talking like cold. There's real-time transit information, security cameras, and emergency telephones. I'm much more likely to wait and ride the bus than I would be if, if I was out here just on the side of the road freezing to death, literally, I'd just jump in my car. And trees. Add a standard design to allow for tree grates to be installed on the platforms. Which sit high off the ground, like a train station. Nine inch curbs, a near level boarding experience, which reduces the boarding time. And putting extra wide doors on the bus helps speed things along too. 
But the biggest secret to making BRT work on an existing city street is to run a lot of buses. Sometimes as often as one every 10 minutes. You're not looking at a schedule, you're not checking your watch. You're basically just walking out and a bus will be arriving, you know, within a few minutes. Metro Transit have made sure to put all of these amenities on all the routes, including on the cheapest arterial BRTs, the ones you might affectionately nickname fake BRT. But think about this. It also means the bus cuts through neighborhoods, which puts BRT right in front of the houses of people who'd ride BRT. In the case of the line I'm riding today, the strategy seems to be paying off. We've seen anywhere from you know, 30 to 50 percent ridership increases from pre-opening day on the D-line in particular from last summer to this summer, we've seen almost a 70 to 80 percent ridership increase. That's partly because the trip using BRT should be 20 percent faster than the old city bus route. To help make that happen, BRT makes fewer but more meaningful stops along the way. Another trick is called transit signal priority. Holding the green light a little bit longer so the bus can make more green lights. But it's not just taking a slow bus and speeding it up. It's also about making the bus's travel time consistent every day of the week. Transit planners call this reliability. It's easy to schedule a bus that arrives on time if it's just slow, but it's consistently slow the same amount of time every day. If it takes two minutes to get through a segment one day, seven another day, and 10 another day, it's very difficult for the transit agency to know what to do there and our riders to know when to expect that. The big cause of this is, unlike a train, the city bus is also stuck in the traffic jam with the rest of us. Particularly when we're operating in a downtown environment affected by traffic congestion. So you could give the bus its own lane. This can help a high ridership bus route stay a high ridership bus route. That tool I think is really important both from a speed standpoint um, in terms of getting out of traffic but especially from a reliability standpoint. I gotta be honest that's probably the scariest drone flight I've ever done. Of course a dedicated bus lane is just the first tool in making BRT really cool. To keep the YouTube algorithm happy, I would have to post multiple times a week, which would mean being here indoors, talking about American roads in front of suspiciously European looking stock footage. Or worse, you'd have to endure clickbait about my life that has nothing to do with traffic engineering. But thanks to you contributing at patreon.com slash roadguyrob, that lets the videos be a little better than they might otherwise be if I was trying to play the YouTube algorithm game. And frankly, isn't it more fun to be doing something different for a change? The dedicated bus lane is pretty cool because it makes the bus kind of look like a train, don't you think? Which is the entire point. But what if you wanted to feel even more like a train? Well, you could use the carpool lane on the freeway. The orange line zips along down the middle of Interstate 35W. Problem is, if you need to make a stop, you'd have to cut across all the lanes of the freeway and take an exit. But good news, they fixed that problem. There's a I-35W in Lake Street Station, which is a brand new station that we built as a part of the project with really close collaboration with MnDOT, our state DOT, to let the buses not have to deviate out of the center lane and to just directly enter the transit stations. But I can't take you inside because the elevators are broken. The station's closed, but there's more than one. And so we're the next one down here at 46 and I-35W inside a nice booth that's heated in the winter time. And warm stairs take you upstairs to the cross street where you can catch local city buses. Pretty peaceful considering what it sits on top of. And there's traffic zooming at 60 miles an hour on both sides of us because we're right in the middle of the freeway. The doors to the bus are on the right hand side. The bus, when it comes in, can't just pull up to the station. It has to cross over to the opposite side. And so the bus arriving is on the left instead of the right. It's kind of interesting. But if you stay on a BRT or light rail train long enough, you end up at the third leg of the Twin Cities Triangle, Mall of America. 5.6 million square feet of indoor shopping and whatnot. And it's attached to 12,000 parking spaces, a trophy to 20th century suburbanization. Not the sort of place you'd think would be transit friendly, except it is. In 1994, they turned the entire first floor of the parking garage into a transit hub. And it's not just the BRT routes that come in here, it's all the local routes too. And the original blue line light rail ends here. 
you ever seen a railroad crossing signal inside a parking structure? Well, here you go. <laughs> Somewhere north of 2 million passengers a year either hop on or off a bus or train here or pass through this garage. But what if we wanted to make a bus rapid transit line that went beyond bus lanes and freeways and actually had its own strip of concrete, like a flat railroad track? This is that top third level of BRT, and when you're building so many new bridges, the project is not cheap. Metro Transit's gold line here, just north of half a billion dollars. It sure seems an awful lot for a bus, but when you consider a comparable light rail train would have cost billions of dollars, plural, if similar ridership turns up, it could be a really good deal. The gold line would be Metro Transit's sixth BRT. We have B line, E line, F line, all those future letters that are in the pipeline. Line. We have gold line and purple line we just discussed. Those are being added to the system. Where we can say we are building a network of BRT lines can talk less about individual lines and more about what the network is doing overall. And that success was incremental and built over time. He tells me it took Minnesota a long time to get this built out. So if your town's still lacking a little bit in mass transit, that's okay. You know, I would say don't like start today and expect to have a network of five lines you know, and with a program of projects for five to ten more, start with a successful corridor and build from there. And it's not to say Minnesota is against light rail. In fact, they're spending a fortune building an expansion to a line right here. That seems to be the big takeaway I get from it. Your city can build out different levels of transit between the average local bus service and billion dollar trains. And even when it comes to bus rapid transit, not all routes need to be the fanciest, most expensive kind. If an area is going to work just fine with arterial BRT, well, don't think you have to wait for the more expensive one. Don't let your tool mold your service needs. It's the other way around. Like, find a tool that really works for you to meet your exact need instead of so focusing on, say, meeting the gold rating, silver rating. Instead of just obsessing with those ratings, just focus on those implementing the changes that provides better services to your rider. With so many transit projects happening, it's probably not the last time we'll head up to the Twin Cities. If you like what you see right now, come back in three to five years, you're gonna see a very different network when you come next time. So I saw a medical emergency when I was riding one of the BRT routes. If you wanna hear that story, head over to patreon.com slash roadguyrob. I figured we could do a little behind the scenes podcast since, you know, you help pay for it. Maybe answer a few of your questions and a longer cut of my interview with Kyle and Jonathan about BRT in the Twin Cities.